Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with Councillor Reese Van Breda of Sulook, Ontario. For those who may not be aware, the municipality of Sulook is described as an oasis nestled in the picturesque landscape of northwestern Ontario. The community is surrounded by lakes, endless forests, and yes, the rugged Canadian shield. Proudly known as the Hub of the North, Sioux Look plays a pivotal role in connecting 29 remote northern communities to essential services, health care, and more. Strategically located halfway between Thunder Bay, Ontario, and Winnipeg, Manitoba, Sioux Look is a gateway connected to destinations across Canada and beyond through air, rail, road, and yes, even water. With that being said, here's our interview with Sulook Councillor Reese Van Breda. Councillor, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk to us today. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And I want to start by getting to know who you are. Before we talk about the municipality of Sioux Lookout, I want to talk about who you are. So I want to start with a general question, but it is a sort of premise of the entire show. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Councillor? Yeah, no, of course. I want to say thanks for having me on the show. That would say that it started pretty young. I would say that both my parents, like growing up, we moved around a lot as a kid. Both my parents were, were like in, um, were in very strong working unions. So even when I was a kid, it was always, um, you know, workers have to stand together. But like both my parents did a lot of activities with the unions. So even when I was a kid, it was a lot of like understanding that when unions win all workers win. And that was installed in me since I was a young kid. Uh, I remember when I was 10, uh, me and my mom volunteered for Howard Hampton's 2004 campaign. And because Howard Hampton was from Kenora Rainy River at the time. And I had a lot of fun with that. We were putting signs together. We were walking around, you know, knocking on doors. I remember that was my first forte, I guess, into politics. Had a lot of fun. Um, met Howard a few times, really nice guy, really got me into like that progressive politics. And then when I was older, so this was summer of 2013, summer of 2014, I actually worked with Sarah Campbell, who was the MPP for Kenora Rainy River for those two summers. And I worked with her 2014 Ontario uh, campaign. Again, a lot of fun, a lot of work, but it was, you know, knocking on doors every day, making phone calls, you know, and like, I had such a great amount of fun. And again, I think Sarah Campbell is the reason why I'm into politics now, because she really installed that, you know, be the change that you want to see, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So even when, yeah, so like even when I, like I was working with her, she really saw that like, you know, people from Northern Ontario, like we have to stick together because, you know, when we're in a province that's dominated by, you know, the GTA, the up to the North, like we have to stick together. And then but when it, I was- it, um, it brings up a good question. I apologize to interrupt here, uh, Reese. If Do you mind if I call you Reese or do you prefer counselor? Yeah, no, you? yeah, no, yes. Okay, uh, so- uh, I, I, it seems like you get involved in the back end of politics, which is where traditionally most people start their political journey, volunteering with through non whether through a political campaign, provincial, municipal, or federal. But you decide to jump into the political arena yourself. So when was the moment you decided that you no longer wanted to be the person in the background, but you wanted to be the person on the ballot and on the sign? <laughs> Well, yeah, I remember even when I was a kid, uh, I remember when my parents would ask, like, what do you want me when I grew up? I, like, I want to be prime minister. And like, you know, when I was like nine, 10 and stuff, um, I would say that um, when the moment that I was like, OK, like we need change. I think it was the 2019 federal election. Because remember, I was living abroad in Peru um, at the time and um, I was kind of getting involved with like what was happening and the Kenora running at the time. And um, so like not to get partisan or anything, but we have a conservative member of parliament who's like pretty much first job is being our member of parliament. 
And um, now that being a counselor, it's kind of like you understand that, you know, you have to walk before you like you run. And so uh, kind of working with that, I was living abroad and then I was, and then during the pandemic, I was actually stuck in Israel in the country for seven months, uh, moved back to Ottawa, uh, worked there for a year, went back to school and then couldn't really find meaningful employment. Um, and so my mom who lives here in Sulaco said, you know, come back home, you know, there's more jobs than people up here in Sulaco. So I'm like, you know what? Sure. I applied for a job. Uh, I got it. Uh, thank goodness. And then moved back up here. And this was in summer of 2021. And then I know that like being here for a few months, being from the area, um, when the 2022 election was kind of gearing up, people were getting ready. Um, I saw that there's a need for the younger generation, you know, people who, you know, don't own a business, people who rent, people who, you know, because Sulaco is a very transient community, right? People, um, Sulaco is known for fast tracking your career. So we have a lot of healthcare professionals, lots of pilots, lots of um, like blue collar workers who come up here, kind of get their experience and then go back to Toronto or wherever uh, it is. And I just thought, you know what? The timing feels right. I feel right. And basically like, and my mom said, I was talking with this with, uh, with my mom and she said, if you're gonna do it, can you commit a hundred percent? Cause you're not, a, you will be a counselor a hundred percent of the time. And I thought by myself and I just say, you know what? I'm going to do it. And then that's what um, like was like the hood spot to kind of like get me to run back in 2022. Was it always municipal for you though? Because you, your track record from what, I, from what I've un, uh, gathered from the conversation we've had so far, you start provincially with Howard Hampton, then you move to Peru, you spend some time in Israel, you're in Ottawa, it seems like there would be a federal aspiration there. But at the end of the day, you, as you say, and you, I'm quoting you here, you walk before you run. So you start municipally. Had you had interest municipally prior to that uh, decision to run in 2022? Or was it like many others that I've spoken to that municipal was there? You kind of knew about it, but you didn't really know the intricate details of what was going on at City Hall or Town Hall. Town Hall. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> you have to be a leader uh, in your backyard first, right? You kind of, you have to kind of like learn how local politics works before you go up to federal level, right? And so... I mean, like, you kind of have to, like, in the sphere of, of of politics, you know, you have to start local. Like, that's where, I would say, that's where the real change happens, right, is the local politics. Like, that's when, that's that's the really hard-handling politics. It's not really the federal level or the provincial. It's the local level that you get people, like, really involved with politics. You know, they're really into it and everything. So, um but is I there mean, not is there not an apathy because provincial federal those are the quote unquote sexy politics right those are the ones that people get riled up about those are the ones that you hear about unless your property taxes go up 10 or 20 percent oftentimes you don't <laughs> exactly oftentimes you don't really hear about what's going on at the local council table when you were out campaigning in that 2022 election, were people engaged? Were people wanting to talk about the issues that of Sue Lookout? Or was there an apathetic undertone of, eh, okay, do I know you? I'm going to vote for you. No, like, I mean, definitely so, like, so I work full-time and I work at the LCB on Saturday. So sun, I spent every Sunday, pretty much, spring and summer and fall of 2022, literally going door to door and knocking on doors, talking to people and basically like you know i think people people want to change people are like okay we've had you know we um we there's so the six counselors and the mayor no one was running against the mayor at the time and then only three out of the six councils were running for re-election so there was three open seats and so it was kind of like you know sulaco you know people want to hear good things about their community. People want to be proud of their community. And when you look out, you know, we're the only community in Northwestern Ontario that's actually growing. You know, we grew from the 2021 uh, census. We grew 10.8%. 
which is the best growth uh, in Northwestern Ontario. We were the only community actually west of Thunder Bay that actually grew in size. You know, Dryden, Kenora, Atticoke, and Fort Francis, all those communities lost, but we're the ones gained, gaining population. So I, I mentioned that there is a rare keyhole of opportunity here that, you know, I don't want to pass up, that, you know, we're a growing community, you know, we have a housing problem, we have aging, if, sorry, aging infrastructure, where I know every community has that too. You know, we have a lot of issues at hand, but we have growth. So, we, you know, we have to really like grab the bull by the horn and say like, I want to make sure that this growth is going to be consistent. And also this growth is going to lead to like lasting change in the uh, community. And so again, talking like door to door, like that's how you get people like energized to say, oh, you know, I don't know who you are. Like, I don't know your last name doesn't ring any bells. And you start talking, be like, grew up in Kenora, mom's from Pickle Lake. I spent pretty much every summer in Sioux Lake, Pickle Lake. So from the North, you know, I understand the needs, you know, I'm running because, you know, we're in this rare keyhole of opportunity here in Sioux Lake that no other community in the Northwest is kind of dealing with, which is growth. We have a growing tax base. Now we have to um, attract and retain um, a lot of these workers like who come in, nurses, pilots, doctors, people who work for the health authority. So like, that's what really got people riled up. And like, I feel humble that like I won, but now like in, like, like in council, right? That's kind of where um, the action happens. So we're, we're recording this 14 months after you've been sworn in in your first term. So we're not at the halfway mark. We're coming up to it this year. Was it what you expected? We have municipal leaders across this country who tune into this show on, on a regular basis. And whenever I ask this question, I often hear feedback saying, thank you for asking this question, because I want to be prepared for when I run or if I decide to run, what I should be looking for. Looking back on the first 14th month of your first term, is it what you expected to be a municipal councillor in the municipality of Sioux Lookout? It, yeah, I mean, it is and it isn't. Like, it is in um, in terms of, you know, obviously working with federal and and uh, provincial policy. You kind of, like, you understand, like, what's in your lane. You know that, I know how people, like, when I was, like, running, every, uh, even uh, people now talk about health or education or this, and I would say, like, listen, like, um, we are just puppets of the province. You know, if Doug Ford tells us we got to do this, we don't have a choice. We got to do it. And, and then four so, months later, he overturns that decision. Exactly. And four months, but, oh, we got to do this. And also, we know that, you know, the Ford government has not been uh, too kind to, to like, and municipalities and we've seen that too going into the budget 2024 we you know like just this week as we're speaking toronto is facing like a 10.5 percent increase in property taxes luckily we're not we're not that bad uh like knock on wood but you know every community is facing this challenge in 2024 we're dealing with the cost of living crisis dealing with inflation uh, and everything so i know that like talking to people there's still that um disillusionment or like um, misinformation that's saying that, oh, as a counselor, you know, can you help us with this and that? And I said, you know, with there's only like a limited amount of power that we can do. However, you know, I, you know, what I can do as a counselor is that I can maybe do a motion or maybe do um, a, a uh, petition or some sort and get that sent to the MPP um, or something. But, you know, as a counselor, yeah, there is, I feel like one hand is always tied behind your back at all times. But I do say though, the one thing that it it is hard is that again, I tell people that like, you know, we have six counselors and a mayor. Uh, you know, we don't have strong mayors, you know. Uh the role of the mayors was gutted in the mid 1990s under the previous conservative administration. So, you know, if I have an idea. And, you know, I want to more for, move forward with something. That's great. But I have to convince the five other counselors and the mayor to vote in favor of it, too. And they there there has been uh, votes in council that's been, you know, three, four to three, three to four. And it's been kind of like a little debate uh, here and then. So, like, I'm glad that I'm in my seat because I'm able to vote for a community infrastructure, community uh, improvement. But again, 
I got to, I tell people like you got me, but you gotta get the five other counselors and the mayor on, on board too, because if they're not, it won't pass. So how do you make those decisions? Because at the end of the day, you have to make the tough decisions when you're around that council table. And that means you have to engage with residents, read the reports that administration puts together for you, and make the ultimate decision. And I'm assuming after 14 months in the job, and if you didn't know this beforehand, you're about to know this, as I say it, you're not going to please 100% of the people of your community. So how do you balance the needs of your community with the needs of the individual while understanding that at the end of the day, you live and die by the vote you make? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in being a politician, you have to be open to change. You have to be open to, you know, what do I think? But then, you know, I want to get the facts on the ground and see, you know, what else is going on in the community so like for example we have local road road boards so be, before amalgamation sulacal was just a town but then we were amalgamated now we have the townships of drayton alcona hudson where i live which was once a local services board so now uh the size of sulacal yeah, has literally like quadrupled right so a lot of these once rural roads now have to be uh on a provincial standard. And so like uh, for example, this was earlier uh, this year, there was a vote on what to do with these with some of these local uh, road boards. And I said, you know what, before I vote on this, I wanna visit these people who live on these roads. And so that like, that's what I did. I, I went to a lot of like the rural parts of uh, Sulaco, which is like the township of Alcona, spoke to people who live on these road boards and say, okay, so you're spending, you know, on top of your property taxes, an extra three, four, five hundred dollars to kind of maintain your road and to keep it up to a standard. And um, and then just talk to them about, you know, how that's how that affects them. So now going into council to vote on that, you know, you, you have kind of like the information on the ground. But also it's about like being ready being educated, being informed, and also like being open to change. So it's like there were a few times too when when you first get the report from the CAO, from the clerk, and you're like, you know, no or yes or something like that. And then once you get talking with the community members and everything, you realize that, yeah, you can be open to change on both ends, whether it be a, a no to a yes vote or a yes to a no vote. So, I mean, yeah, again, you do live and die by, by the vote, but again, um, you want to make sure that you're, you're open to change and that you know kind of like what, what you're getting into. So then then in election 2026, when that happens, you can say, I voted this way because X, Y, and Z, you know, I saw on the ground that this was happening, that that was happening. I was talking to people and this was mentioned and that was mentioned. So I just like collected as much information as you can before you go into the vote is the most important thing. I have one last question around the voting aspect of the job, because your job is to represent all the people, even the ones who did not vote for you, because you, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you are elected at an at-large basis. So that means you're not a ward counselor. You are a Sioux lookout counselor for the entire community, just like the mayor, but you are a counselor. Now, you have to go out, engage with residents, whether they voted for you or against you, whether they agree with you or disagree with you. Is it a hard part of the job to listen to people who might vehemently disagree with you, but you still have to understand that they have the right to disagree with you because you're their elected official. No. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, working at the LCBO, like you definitely get, it's a very social job, right? You get people who come in they're like, I don't want my, my property taxes going up. I don't care what you got to do. No tax increase. You know, we're, we're paying way too much. And then I have to say like, listen, we're going through the cost of living crisis. We're going through union negotiations. We're going through this and, and going through that. You know, if I could not raise property taxes, like 100% would do that all the way. But, you know, back to reality, you know, we're going, you know, every community across Ontario, across Canada as well, is going through so much and that, um, you know, having to listen to them and say, yep, you know, I totally agree with what you're saying but you know let's look at like through my my perspective you know i want to make sure that the town employees are paid well i want to make sure that we attract and retain people coming 
to Sue Lookout. And the only way we're, we're that we're going to do that is if we um, invest in our community. I want to make sure that our community infrastructure is growing with the community. So yeah, your property taxes, you know, might go up, but they're going up, but you're getting X, Y, and Z in return. So it's not just going up for no reason. It's going up because, you know, we're going to invest in redoing downtown Front Street. We're building the Hillcrest subdevelopment. We're building the Bigwood uh, development near the airport. We're making infrastructure improvements on, you know, this street and that street. We're building the, you know, so people see that their property taxes are at work. So I want to turn to, uh, to Sue Lookout as a whole now. And before I do that, I'm going to preface this question with this statement. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is just the councillor's perspective on the questions I'm about to pose. The first question I have, though, and it's an important one, is in your opinion, what do you believe, and I think I know where this is going to go because I've just read a recent article that you uh, gave an interview with a local newspaper, what do you believe is the biggest issue facing Sioux Lookout today as of recording this episode? I think, you know, two, the cost of, the two things, the, co the cost of living and housing. When we hired our, our new economic development officer, this was earlier last year, we all had a chance to, to meet with them. And basically, I just said, if we ain't talking housing, I don't want to talk because that is the number. You talk to everybody in Stulico, it's always cost of living, housing, cost of living, housing, 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 saying, you know, I spend this amount of money for my apartment. You know, I'm trying to get my partner to move up here. There's nowhere to live. And I say 110%. Like, how, but again, housing, housing is one of those issues that, you know, as a counselor, I can only do so much that, like, Everybody wants housing. You go through, you know, we we put all our eggs into this one basket to, to try and apply for the CMHC uh, federal housing. But you know what, though? Every community is also putting their eggs in that basket. So we're fighting with all the other Northwestern Ontario uh, communities instead of working with them, of course. So um, that's the one thing, too. But also the cost of living. So the number one thing though that I'm trying to kind of right the wrong is that, so Sue Lookout, we used to be on the Northern Living Allowance. This is back in the day in the 1980s. I say that, that's like a long time ago, but it wasn't. So I we feel so watching. old right now. Thank you so much. <laughs> I know, I know. Back in the day, I remember like my parents would always say, you know, again, my mom grew up in uh, uh, Pickle Lake, which was the farthest North that you can go by road um, in Ontario of the Highway 599. And so, you know, Sioux Lookout used to be on that. It used to be uh, like Pickle Lake, Savant Lake, uh, Sioux Lookout, Ear Falls, and Red Lake. And in the mid-1990s, Sioux Lookout got taken off of it. And I've been trying to do research, do research to find out why we were taken off of it. What was the reason why, you know, was who basically like who done it, where, why, and how. Can't find anything. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying still to work with other uh, communities as well to put us back on it because again it's not just about silica it's about northwestern ontario communities working together and say you know the cost of living crisis is hitting us hard you know we have an mp who always says that he's for affordability and making life easier for everyone okay you're talking the talk but now he's an option to like walk the walk here's a tangible example of what you can do to make the cost of living you know easier to live work and invest in Sioux Lookout easier for everybody because again Sioux Lookout I'm not talking to talk bad about about us but you know we don't have a tangible industry base like Red Lake has the mines uh Ear Falls has the OPG dam as well as a sawmill Dryden has the, their paper mill but Sioux Lookout we don't have like a tangible uh, industry base are kind of like rely on for that big tax uh, tax base. You know, we don't have natural gas up here too. So, you know, to power my house, I'm just using hydro electricity, which, you know, is pretty expensive now. Um, I feel like everybody who I know, including myself, is on a payment plan to like pay for the hydro. And that's just, you know, the, the cost of living crisis, like that's affecting everybody. So I'm saying that like, if you were to put Sulaco back on the Northern Living Allowance, you know, if you give, and, and, and like I said this all the time, this is what I've been told I was a kid, took in school, 
um, economics, if you give the middle class a tax break, they will always spend that money back into their community. If you give the, the middle class, you know, an extra $2,500 at the minimum, even more, they will always spend that money back into the uh, community. So it is, in effect, a win-win for everybody, right? Because when I was in the Dryden Council, I said, if you gave everybody in Sulaco more money, guess where they're going to spend it? In Dryden, right? The Walmart, uh, yeah. the extra foods. And everything it's you know, the trickle to- down right it's the trickle down effect where you give people money back there they will spend it in their communities and therefore those community businesses will be able to oh, keep open for a little bit longer and so on and so forth exactly exactly yeah but the million semi-million dollar question i have to follow up with that statement is with which what you've talked about the cost of living housing that doesn't seem like it's going away <laughs> And I'm not trying to be rude here, yeah. counselor, but what do you do as a counselor, as a municipality in the short term to ensure that the emotions, the budgets that you pass don't impact people that are already being impacted by cost of living and housing that they can't find? Yeah, you know what? <laughs> that, that is the million dollar question. You know, if I had the answer to that question, I would be prime minister right now, probably. But, you know, that is the hard hitting issues that around the council table, that is what we are debating. That is what, because, you know, everybody has their own perspective of, you know, people, some people say 0% tax increase, you know, I don't care if you got to cut funding to the library, you got to cut funding to that library. You know what I mean? Or I guess we're not going to update our roads or we're not going to, you know, have that, that street light uh, redone. So it, like, again, like, that that's a hard issue. I know that going into the 2020, 2024 budget out of this, at the time of this interview, we have our first uh, meeting about it next week, about what we can e- expect in the next budget, kind of like what are the hard hitting issues that as a council we would have to vote on. And of course, like live or die by the vote. But you know what, like that is a hard hitting issue. And that's saying that, you know, as a community, you know, as a council member, you are between a rock and a hard place because like we we don't have the option to take on more debt. You know, we're not like a province that, you know, we can we we can go billions of dollars in debt just to pay it off. You know, like we don't you know, we are between a rock and a hard place. Like We have to make sure the, the books are balanced every year, no matter what. And so, you know, the, the last thing I want to do is, you know, have proper taxes, no offense to, to the city of Toronto property taxes go up 10.5%. Like, you know, that would that would be hard to, to swallow for anybody, right? Well, but, try swallowing a 39% tax increase. There's a municipality in BC, as of recording this, who has a 39% tax increase on their books this year. Well, okay, well, I think, <laughs> yeah. You know, my hearts go out to those councils and those mayors, because that's, you know what? I'm sure they're they're probably they're probably feeling that pinch through trying to figure out how do you deal with that? And because again, too, Ontario is so big, and you know we are puppets of the province. So the, the province says you must spend money on this, you must do this, you must do that. We have no option. We have we have to do that as well. So, so you I mean, talked you've talked about the issues that you believe that are important: cost of living, housing crisis. Now you you said, and I think I'll believe you that if I go talk to a hundred people, they they'll give me those macro issues as well. They'll talk about the cost of living. They'll talk about the housing crisis, but they're going to also talk about the micro issues. And the micro issues are where municipalities thrive because those are the things that they can accomplish quickly. Now, not all of them, because I guarantee you, not every municipality can build a brand new pool tomorrow and open it up for their residents to use. But how do you balance the micro issues, like the pothole in front of my house, the the uh, up the longer hours at the library with those macro issues? Because the micro issues are the ones that people feel passionate about. Exactly. Yeah. So like, I always say to you that like, you know, here in Sulaco, we have more jobs than people. You walk down our downtown, there is just people offering you jobs left, right, and center because we have a big labor shortage. So I know that when a few people like come up to me and they say, you know, 
why is the library, you know, only open, you know, three days a week? It used to be open seven days a week. I, I remember 10 years ago, you know, this was stopped and now we have like no staff. Yeah. So like taking those issues and say, why is there no staff? Like exactly. So like, how do we attract and retain people to come up to Sulaco? What can we do to ensure that people, if once they come up here, let's say there's a nurse working up here for a year. I, I want to make sure that, that at the end of their 12 months here, they say, man, love Sulaco. I want to stay here. I want to move here, you know, or people who, uh, who maybe who is the pilot working for the, you know, with say airlines, sky care, bear screen airlines say, you know what, Sulaco, this is the real hub of the North, you know, there's a lot going on here. So again, I, I tell people like, you know, the the micro issues are always part of a you know a bigger issue or, or a, a bigger problem right yeah people complain that you know why is service ontario only open two days a week i say you know because they got to come from dryden because there's no one to work here right so i'm saying that like but like why is that you know what can we do to fix that so that you know we can attract and retain people to come to come up here because again I think that's the main issue facing a lot of these smaller uh, communities that are off the trans counter, right? So it's not just Sulaco. I know that Pickle Lake is dealing with a large shortage as well. You go to like Manitowoc or Horn Payne, where my dad lives. Everybody's hired. Everybody's looking for people left, right, and center. Especially too, because again, we're going to be facing a a a, a demographic crisis in, within the next. 15 to 20 years as these baby boomers start to retire, right? So how are we going to fill the vacancies now to re to to build up our economy? But what are we going to do 15 and 20 years, you know, probably even less than that when all of these workers who have been working, let's say, at the community being the chief mechanic for the past 20 years and then they retire, how are we going to you know, attract for those future ones as well. So again, I would say like the micro is always, you know, the micro is always this, uh, the sign, but like the symptom is always something much bigger, right? I, I often get accused on this show of only talking about the negative things about municipalities. So I'm going to flip the script a little bit here. And I'm going to ask a very another pointed question. And that is, what does Sue Lookout do right what is the thing that your municipality boasts about when you go to AMO, when you talk to fellow councillors from across North, uh, Northern Ontario, what do you say that you're doing right in your community? I always say that like you would never find a community like Sulaco anywhere in Ontario. So we're a town of 5,800 people with a catchment area, wow. the geographical size of France, which encompasses 33 First Nation communities, 28 of which are fly-in. So we are the service hub, service, uh, health, and education hub for, again, 33 First Nation uh, communities. So I say that you would never find that anywhere else in Ontario. And again, I tell you, that is our economy. We are the hub of the North for a reason. You know, that is our economy. That is our future as a community, is that we are the, the service hub for the north you know we have we have a fantastic new airport which was just recently redone in 2019 but i guess nobody knew what was going on what was going to happen in 2020 right so luckily we hit those pre covid 19 targets those so now we're officially back to normal now you know we have a great community infrastructure and again like being a council member services they're great but you know they do cost they do cost a lot of money and again that's that's where the hard hitting debates around the council table is right is saying you know you know we're a service hub but again we don't you know we don't have that industry behind us as well you know we used to have an air force base here with closed down in the 80s you know we used to have the sawmill here in Hudson um on Lac Sewell closed down in 2015 uh, i believe or 2018 you know we used to have CN used to employ a lot of people here. So like with the changing economic conditions, luckily we were able to kind of adapt to it. I think that like Kenora and Sulaco were uh, the biggest communities that actually made that shift. Cause I know I grew up in 
uh, Kenora as well. We Kenora had their Abitibi paper mill, which was probably the biggest employer in town. I remember when that shut down, I think 2007, 2008, I was like, I was in grade seven. Kenora was, had to force to make that shift to the service economy, to the tourism economy, being on Lake of the Woods, being close to Winnipeg, being close to, you know, the border of the, like, of the, um, of the U.S. So, I mean, Sulaco, I, I would say that we're still like the beacon of growth and development in the region where, you know, a lot of these smaller communities are facing like a shrinking tax base because, you know, people are saying, you know, why would I live in the community when I can live, you know, maybe 15 minutes away and be in unorganized territory and like escape the property taxes, which is the new thing now, right? To kind of live outside of the town, town limits, still enjoy being close to town, but you know, instead of paying proper taxes towards the town, you're just paying the proper taxes to, to the province every year, right? Out, so wait, what? So the the rural area of Sioux Lookout, you pay the property taxes to the province, not to a rural No, community? yeah, so <laughs> if you don't live, yeah, so like, so so let's say Sioux Lookout, the geographical like area, so let's say like also in uh, Kenora too, if you live outside of town limits, like you're outside yeah. of the limits of the city, you don't pay property taxes to the town. You pay property taxes to the province. So if um, if you live in, let's say, De Norwick, or which is uh, the community is just sixty kilometers south of here on the Trans Canada. If you live in Menaki, close to Kenora, if you live in Reddit, those are like unorganized territories. So you don't there's no mayor and council so you just i i, I, I get the concept i just i didn't think ontario had those like i worked for uh, queen's park for almost a year and i did they're not only, know they're, they're only up north you don't have like i remember when i was in when i was down south this was like this was last summer i was talking to someone he's like yeah i'm a reeve of a county now i'm like what's a county and what's a reeve and i'm like oh yeah i'm from up north we have districts like we don't have counties we don't have uh regions we have only up north it's just districts so we're we're part of the Kenora district so we have the KDSB Kenora D district services board which does ambulance which does the nonprofit housing and that's provincially funded right and it, some money does come from the town as well but yeah that's like the kind of like the new thing too is just like if you list so let's say I live in Kenora and I'm like I'm sick of paying Kenora property taxes I can just moved to maybe Clearwater Bay, which is right outside. That's not an uh, organized community. And you can just pay taxes to the province. The more you know, yeah. 2024, no I thought I learned enough about doing 178 of these episodes in 2023, 2024. My mind's going to be blown again. And you've just blown my mind for yeah. the first time in 2024. Um, <laughs> Counselor, you talked about something that is near and dear to my heart. And that is tourism. And I want to talk about tourism because I think it's an important conversation that municipalities do not have enough topic time for because the province usually does it, the majority for themselves. But what are the tourist hidden gems of your community? What are the things you tell tourists as a tourist coming to your community in 2024 will be doing? And that is me, for those who are wondering, <laughs> what should I come and see before sitting down and having a coffee with yourself on a Sunday? Because that's the only day it seems like you have off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, luckily, though, on Sunday, everything's pretty much closed anyway. Um, I'm going to say, like, like every northern Ontario um community like it's all about the outdoors like i would say be like we are the hidden gem off the trans canada which is hard because people don't want to leave the leave the trans canada i'm like if you want to experience like the real you know rural northern ontario living you gotta get off the trans canada like you gotta go to and like my favorite places are armstrong which is three hours north of thunder bay also on the cn line sulaco pickle lake like these are like the real Northern Ontario um, uh, living. So we have like, we do have a lot that, that makes us unique. I would say that we have the excellent hiking trails. We have Cedar Bay, which is crown land, which is just uh, right outside of the town limits. That's that's walking trails, skiing trails, the fat bike trails as, as well. You know, I say also too, you gotta, you gotta come for the people. I don't say like Living in Toronto, leaving it in Ottawa was good, but I find that up here is just like, 
I've never felt more accepted, more open, more dynamic than I did here back in Northwestern Ontario. I mean, I find that everyone here is uh, open to you with open arms. But of course, if you're into, you know, hunting, fishing, we have Laxuel Floating Lodges, which is one of the best in Ontario. They can show you around too. And I'm, Say too that you know we have a lot of local local coffee shops, local businesses that are absolutely like fantastic. But you know, what do you, where do you go? Where do you go after a long day of work? But it seems like you're working a lot. But where do you go to decompress after a long week, after a long day, to just recenter yourself in your community? Yeah, I, my first thought was just. Home. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say every counselor mayor I've asked that question to as all, all often wants to say home. So I if you yeah, want to no, say it, go for it. No, definitely home, but I think like living in Hudson. So Hudson is a community which is a part of Sulaco. It used to be its own little small community on a local services board. I would just say like walking around Hudson is definitely like a definitely a good decompressor going for uh, a bike ride. There's so many hiking trails along Hudson, along um, Laxu. Laxu definitely has been voted one of the best fishing spots in all of Canada. And it's just like the people here definitely like make it make it worthwhile. Like I just walk over to my friend's house and say, hey, what's up? You know, want to have a coffee? Do you want to like just talk about your day? It's always 100%. Come on in, you know, coffee's on. I'll put on uh, um, a, like a pot for you. But to decompress, yeah, definitely after a long day, you know, especially after a long council meeting, you know, coming home, um, you know, luckily I have a great view of Lac Sewell. You can't see it, but like a great view of Lac Sewell. Seeing that view every day, having a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or just eating supper and just looking at that view, you're like, okay, you know, time to kind of decompress time to like collect your your, your bearings definitely like it, it makes it like worthwhile yeah li uh, living out because I remember living in Toronto uh having to literally commute four hours a day on top of your eight hour work day you have to leave work at 6 a.m to be at work for 8 30 you know leave work at 4 35 get back home at seven and eight immediately straight to bed you could you got to be up the next day at like four o'clock to be out the door by six right so there's definitely that higher living standard standard than being up north so that so you're, you're painting the picture that i'm going to ask here already <laughs> but i'm going to ask you to paint it even vibrant for me yeah paint a picture of why sue lookout is such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family. I mean, I would have to say that like the volunteerism, you know, if you want to come up here and you understand that, like, you know, I, I know like I'm moving from Toronto because, you know, the city life is too much for me. You know, I want to move somewhere where, you know, it, it's it's more of a community. I would definitely say Sulaco is, is definitely like your choice because we have so many um, volunteer opportunities there's so many ways to, to get engaged in your community you know everyone is is looking for more volunteers to join their sports team and, and looking for more people to kind of join their club or their um committee say that Sulacal, you know we are you know we're a safe environment we're an open and dynamic community that like we want you up here you know we're a community that's saying you know we're growing and we want you to, to, to grow with us, right? So like, we want you to move up here. We want you engaged in your, in, in our, in our uh, community. Like we want, we want you to not just be a person. We want you to be a friend. We want you to be a neighbor, right? So like, that was like when I first moved up here, you know, I, I got involved in, in a couple of community activities. You know, I joined the, the, uh, the uh, Blueberry Festival committee, which is actually a fun fact too. So the Sudoka Blueberry Festival is the longest running summer festival in Northwestern Ontario. We had our 41st uh, Blueberry Festival last year. So I'm on the committee to make the 42nd even bigger and better, right? So th th there is a lot to offer people. There's a lot of opportunities to get involved in the community and there's lots of opportunities to, to kind of make yourself like 
home, like to make yourself a part of the community. I know I just rented over. I just talked for like 10 minutes there, but. No, I appreciate, hey, if you didn't on an audio show, it'd be really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great when my guests talk. Um, yeah. But counselor, um, I want to thank you. This has been, I, I'll be the first to admit, and I, I, I originally from Ontario, and this is usually the time when I, I sort of spill the beans a little bit. I'm originally from Ontario, moved to Ontario, uh, moved to Alberta, have driven the Transcanada Highway numerous times back and forth to, from Toronto to Calgary, and I can tell you, prior to you reaching out, I had not heard of Sioux Lookout, and that, that, I'm just being completely blunt. But after doing research and then speaking to you. It is a place that I want to come visit. It's a truly a place that I want to come visit because it seems like, and this is just an assumption here, and I know you should never assume, but I'm going to on this show because it's my show. It seems like it's a has a great community spirit that's going through a little bit of a rough part right now. But on the other end, it looks like it has a shining future ahead of it if this cost of living and housing crisis sort of gets settled out. So thank you so much for your opening my eyes to your community over the last 45 minutes. No, of course. I would say like everyone else too, you know, come on up. You know what I mean? Like our doors are wide open. Like you are more than welcome to come up to Sioux Lookout. More than welcome to check out like what we have uh, to to offer. I would say too, like, you know, you could say that we're going through like every community is going through, like right now is going through like a rough path. You know, every yeah. Northern Ontario community is kind of going through their, you know, SWAT, right? Strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats i always say that you know you know we're still the beacon of growth and development in the region you know we're a growing community you know we everybody is hiring everybody's trying to find um new people to come and join but there's always a silver lining in every in every uh, community you know every community like here, like that's why I love like North, like Northwestern Ontario, because every community has like their own vibe, their own culture, their own kind of own, like own kind of like a feel to it. And so, you know, even though we might be geographically pretty far apart, I mean, there's, you go to every community and you're like, wow, like I didn't know that, you know, Ear Falls had this, Kenora had that, you know, this had that. And like, do we, we, yeah, we live in such a unique part of Ontario, it's such a unique part of Canada, they always say it's definitely overlooked. People will say, oh yeah, Kenora, drove past it one day when I was on my way to Winnipeg, right? You know, I was on the way to Thunder Bay because there's only one highway, right? Like you can't get lost in Northwestern Ontario. There's only one highway. Ch no, no, no. Ch challenge accept it because <laughs> I, I pulled off onto the side of the road to take a picture of a sign coming back last summer and I got lost because I forgot. I did not realize I was there. The roundabout was not just a roundabout. It was a dead end street. So I kept on going up a dirt road for about 20 minutes. So you You're can get like, lost if going? you go off the beaten path. Yeah. No, like that was my favorite. Cause I remember when I, when I was a kid, I was working at the Kenora co-op. People would be saying, Oh, you know, I just, you know, I'm, I'm coming from, Alberta and I'm going to Toronto like how much longer is it to Toronto I'm like 25 hours and they're like what I'm like I'm like only one highway right can't miss it there's only one highway pretty much until you hit like Barry and then that's when like the, it splits into like that split highway and yeah um counselor it is a being an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show i look forward to uh, reaching out to you when i'm coming through sue lookout later on the summer hopefully we can sit down and have a coffee and we maybe get a tour of your downtown and your amazing community up close and personal because i think it's time to get more people off the beaten path and go visit some of these great communities that have stories to tell so thank you so much awesome thank you so much thank you for so thank you for having me on the show you know been a fan it's nice to be on it as well now, if you found today's episode insightful and informative, we encourage you to take a moment and hit that subscribe button. By doing so, you ensure that you stay abreast of all our latest content, ranging from the Nestle Affairs to the in-depth insights of the cross-border interviews and the revealing exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, as a platform committed to providing comprehensive coverage of all things municipal, we aim to keep you well-informed, and engaged. Now, your support is crucial in enabling us to grow and maintain the high quality of content that you've come to expect. Now, if you find it within your means, please consider backing the show. 
Every contribution, regardless of size, goes a long way in sustaining and enhancing the depth and breadth of our programming. Now, you can find the link to our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website, conveniently located in the show notes. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.